Sentence that just my mouth cramps. Say it fast. Warrior. That's okay. I've been practicing. I've been practicing. Thank you, Mark. Um, Hello, or good morning. Um, And as you now know, I'm Jay. This is Leah. And together we run a creative studio in Vancouver called Giant Ant that specializes in uh, animation and documentary. And we're not going to talk a lot about our work specifically, but we're going to show you a quick um, two reels of our work, live action and uh, animation, and so you're going to get a sense of what we do to contextualize the rest of all of this. I want to see those eyes that you gave me that so inquisitive, so inquisitive. I wanna see those eyes that you gave me that night. So inquisitive, so inquisitive. the next one. Um, so when Mark asked us to come and speak today, <clears throat> actually when anyone ever asks us to speak uh, f- about anything, usually we think, the first thing that we think of is why would you want us to speak? What do we know about anything, least of all collaboration? But when we thought about it a little bit more, we realized that actually Jay and I have been collaborating together and working together and working out creative problems in some form since, we, since the moment we met. So 
to start things off, we're going to take you through a little bit of a history, quick history of our, uh, our lives working together up until this point. Okay, we met in 2004 at Emily Carr. That's us in 2004. <laughs> um, and after our first date, we decided we were done looking and we started to plan our life together. And a couple weeks after that, Leah was about to go work at a summer camp for kids with disabilities. And I was like, well, that's not in Vancouver. I need to be there. So <laughs> Leah bribed her boss or something, and I ended up getting a job there. But that was our first time working together. So we went from um, being a really new couple to like living and working together in this place. The shower video. So <sighs> this, is, um, this is our first video project ever together. We call it the shower video, lovingly. Um, but what, it, what happened was um, Jay, tragically for me, got his dream job designing furniture in Michigan. So right after we um, spent the summer working at camp, Jay went off to Michigan to make office chairs. Um, <laughs> it was a cool job. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but we were apart, and so uh, Jay came home for Christmas, and um, I don't know why we did this, but we um, made a video of ourselves in the shower. It was like, the, not what you think, but it was like this <laughs> joke kind of thing about how men and women shower differently, and it was sort of this funny thing. And, and then, so we filmed it, and then Jay went back to Michigan, and we kind of edited it um, remotely, so I edited the girl part and Jay edited the guy part and we kind of emailed it back and forth until we both decided that it was terrible. But let's put it on YouTube anyway because nobody like looks at YouTube. So we put this video, um, we put this video on YouTube and it just went bananas viral, um, at the time viral. Uh, so it, 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 uh, it kind of, um, I guess, launched us into our uh, video making lives together. And then Somebody called me from MySpace while I was at work and said, why don't you guys make a series for us? And we were like, okay, that sounds crazy. So we quit our jobs and that was our first, um, our first paid collaboration was a series for MySpace. And then so we did that series and then we found ourselves in this situation where we were kind of these like funny little micro celebrities on MySpace. We got lots of messages and people wanted to do stuff with us. And so we're like, well, let's go to Europe. And we sent this bulletin out to all of our friends on MySpace and said like, hey, we're coming to Europe, can we stay with you? And we got all these messages back. So we went to, you know, started in London and then we hitchhiked from France through Germany and through Austria down to Italy, staying with these people that um, we'd met. Couch surfing on... existed at this time, we just didn't know that. Yeah. So, so we just kind of used MySpace as a couch surf. You know, couchsurfing.com, okay. Yeah. But what we did was made a series about it, so everyone, that picked us up, had a camera in their face, and we made the series, and that was sort of our first real like project together, I suppose, after the other MySpace series. And so we came back, and we thought, okay, this is really fun, and we just kind of started to play, and I guess this is kind of a period of like <laughs> freelancing, I suppose, um, and we did all kinds of weird stuff, like uh, legal interstitials for legal training videos so that lawyers can be recertified, certified. so we did these like little comedy bits in between, so that was weird. We did this, like, a spot from McDonald's, which was weird, um, and then we... It was weird that we did it. It was weird that we did it. Yeah. This, yeah. Stop motion. Yeah. So we were kind of figuring out what we wanted to do and how we wanted to do it. We even went to Tanzania to make a documentary with a bunch of street kids there for six weeks. So that was cool. Um, but through all these kind of, like, like, this dabbling and experimenting, we kind of figured out what kind of collaborators we were, we figured out what we were good at and what we weren't good at, um, and what kind of work made us feel good and what made us feel icky. Um, and then we decided why not become business partners as well because we'd been collaborating together. We'd been, we'd made a lot of videos. We'd learned a lot. So um, we started Giant Ant and we rented a space and bought a phone and plugged it in <laughs> and uh, hoped that it would ring. Um, and very quickly we realized that um, there were people out there that were way better at us than pretty much everything, so we started to, to collect those people and bring them in, and they found us, and, and now there's 14 of us, five of whom are over there, I think. Right, guys? Hey, guys. Hey, make some noise. <laughs> They're shy. Um, so that was Giant Ant, and then um, that worked out okay, so we thought, why not get married? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Which we thought was going to be the most challenging uh, collaboration of them all, but in fact, it was not until two months ago. <laughs> until two months ago. So we decided, let's have a baby 
and we exceeded expectations by 100%, <laughs> and we had two babies. Um, so that's winter on the left and fern on the right, and they are 11 weeks old. So that's um, a, a brief history of our collaboration, and, and all that we've made a huge amount of mistakes, which our team can probably attest to. We've learned a lot of things, and so... So uh, we have put together for you today an easy-to-remember 13-letter acronym <laughs> <laughs> to uh, help you along your way in your collaborations. Um, but mostly, like Jay said, it's stuff that we've just screwed up along the way and tried to learn from and are still trying to learn from. So, um, and for the sake of this, we're sort of defining collaboration as working together with other people to provide creative services for people who hire you. So that's, that's our yeah. lens Specific. right now. Okay, so um, O is for outhouse. Um, so I wanted to come up with a really clever analogy for collaboration, um, and I didn't. So what I did come up with, though, is that collaboration is like building an outhouse with a group of people, because somebody has to dig the hole. And that person is taking the risk, and they're leading the group. And for us, and you can disagree, please do, but for us, collaboration works a lot better when there's somebody at the helm um, taking the risk. So that's the guy who's digging the hole, um, or, or woman who's digging the hole. <laughs> and the, 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 the important thing that that person has to do is put the problem in a box and really define it well. And also, get the right people around you to do the other things. So if somebody's going to put the roof on, somebody's going to you know, attach the toilet seat and all those other... Everybody's done this, right? <laughs> cool. Um, and ultimately, they have to pull you out of the hole. So you really have to trust that group of people and trust that you've brought the right people around you to make the outhouse. Does that work? Okay. Yeah, so outhouse. without a well-defined problem, it's hard to know whether you're succeeding or failing. So dig a hole. Um, L is for love, and we talk about love a lot at Giant Ant. I don't know if you've heard us talk about this stuff before, but we talk about it a lot, and we've got these three rules at Giant Ant, uh, and the third is put love in your work. And this one sounds a bit fluffy, but we feel like being able to love your work or creating a context where loving your work is possible is a really important ingredient to collaboration. And so I think for us, like maybe intuitively or and now intentionally, we've made a long series of decisions that have got us to a place where we feel like we've created a, a place where people can do this. And part of that has been, like, we're in a relationship and we really like each other, so like, we see the world in a certain way and that's why it works. And so we've surrounded ourselves with people that um, maybe have uh, consistent or compatible kind of worldviews and values and tastes and ideas about what good and what bad is in terms of work. Um, and so we put these people together, and then we've also made a really conscious effort to decide what we do and don't take on as a studio. And sometimes those are really shitty business decisions, and sometimes, um, sometimes they're not, I guess. But, um, but it's really important to us that what we do and who we do it with is a statement of how we see the world and how we value our creative integrity and energy. And so creating an environment where people can love the work is important, and it makes the collaboration so much easier. Because the projects are shitty, no one wants to do it, and it falls apart. Okay, Alice for let go, um, and this is uh, this is a tricky one because <clears throat> uh, we ask of our team and uh, and of ourselves to be like fiercely convicted with our ideas and to really fight for them in a group environment. Um, to a point, like you have to kind of let go of of, uh, of your ideas if you trust the collective intelligence of the group. So if you think that the background should be green, but everyone else thinks it should be purple, that's kind of like, your, your collaborative team is kind of your first audience, I suppose. So you have to really, really trust them, let go, and everybody has to move forward holding hands. That's the idea. Even if you go home grumbling about really still wanting that background to be green, move forward holding hands is important. So yeah. get used to letting go of ego, too, perhaps. Um, trust the group, and uh, yeah, and things will work smoother. Yeah. we think. We think. <laughs> A is for asshole. <laughs> Don't be one. <laughs> um, disagreeing and arguing is totally part of the collaborative process, and I think it's a strong part of the collaborative process. And people that disagree and argue and fight for their ideas are the people that are, you know, pushing ideas forward and and challenging you to get to a place that's better than you could have if just everyone was really. 
um, accommodating to everyone else's desires. However, you can be a disagreeing, strong-willed person without being a dickhead. So, um, so that's important. And at Giant Ant, we talked about the three rules. Rule number two is don't be a jerk, but jerk doesn't start with an A, so we're using asshole right now. Um, and if you struggle to not be a jerk, you can try this, the feedback sandwich. And it goes, thank you for giving your opinion. It's really interesting the way you're thinking about it. That's the, the bread part. And then, like, I fundamentally disagree with how you're thinking about this, and I think you're wrong for these reasons, and this is what I think we should do. That's the meat and cheese part. And then, thank you so much again. <laughs> Expressing your opinion is really helping us get to the right answer. And that's the bread. And so it's like sandwiched in. It feels, <laughs> it feels better. Okay, B is for bad ideas, because we all have them. And uh, we feel that as the um, outhouse hole diggers, um, it's our job to create an environment where bad ideas are not only um, allowed, but welcomed, because um, the road to brilliance is paved with terrible ideas. So what usually happens if you create that environment and, and people can sort of spitball and, and not be afraid to, to um, say things that are dumb. And actually, Jay and I pride ourselves in being the ones who usually throw down the, the worst ideas. That's true. Um, usually what happens is somebody will um, take out of that, all that badness a little nugget and turn it into something that's totally unexpected and totally brilliant that you didn't expect you were ever going to get to. So this one's super important. Create an environment where bad ideas are, are, are good. Yeah. <laughs> we like to say that you can't build a strong dung hut without lots of shit. <laughs> we don't actually say that. We've never said that. We never. Um, <laughs> Never said that. Never said that. <laughs> oh God, no. Twitter. <laughs> um, oh. <laughs> Twitter. Oh, it's for orange flag. Actually, when I put this, these slides together, um, I made a nice rainbow, and I like got down the rainbow, and I got to the slide, and it was blue, and I was like, oh. so I had to go and like rearrange the backgrounds. Um, so, as a member of a collaborative team, um, it's your responsibility, it's responsibility to let the group know when you've lost the plot and when you're stuck and when you're lost. And we call this an orange flag because if it's a red flag, it's too late. Like that's the, the SOS panic flag. So, um, and this is hard because it's hard to admit when you're stuck or when you can't get there and it, it's crushing to your ego, especially if you're a leader. But, um, you know, maybe you're stuck, maybe you're distracted, maybe you're hungover, but it's important to know when to just say like, hey, I'm having a hard time. And then that's when uh, people rally around you. And so back to the three rules. The first rule is never miss a deadline. And so to us, what that means is honor your commitments. And I think um, another thing we say about it is, like, if you move a deadline before you hit it, you don't, you can't miss it. Because it's just like, it's further in the future. So if you're expected to do something, you've committed to something, and you know ahead of time that you're not going to be able to manage that commitment, um, you, can, you can adjust the expectation and not fail. So let your team know at the onset, I would say, exactly. that the SOS is, is, you know, call for help, basically, yeah. for, the, for the health of the project. Orange flag. Orange flag. <clears throat> okay, R is for room, um, as in don't be the smartest person in it, um, unless you do feel that you are the smartest person in the room, in which case, that's fine you can return to your desk and you can work the problem out by yourself. And like sometimes collaboration is not always the answer. If you think you have the answer, answers, um, you know, maybe don't assemble a group of people to, to help you figure it out because that will frustrate them. <laughs> um, and, and figuring it out by yourself is, is okay too. But uh, if you're not the smartest person in the room, uh, which we never are, um, make sure that you bring People that are like way better than you at everything, which is sort of how we put together our team at Giant Ant, I suppose. Um, and uh, and and you'll you'll uh, you'll get there quicker, I think. Yeah. yeah, and if you don't value other people's knowledge and opinions, there's not much to learn. And that's boring. Um, a is for authorship, and this is kind of a tricky one because. Like, we like to think of the collaborative environment as one where it's all shared and we're all in it together and we go forward together. And for a long time, we'd always put credits on our work, like on Vimeo and on the website. And it was always like directed by Giant Ant, production by Giant Ant. And a couple of years ago, something called Credits Gate happened where our team staged this intervention with us, kind of, where we all sat around a table and everyone was like, we want credits. 
on the work. And, and we're like, why? Like, we're a team. Like, we love each other. And they're like, but that, like, stop. Like, you guys own the company, so it's Im implied that you're connected to the work. But for us, like, it's, it's kind of fuzzy. And, and it was interesting to think about it that way. And so what we started to do is to break out really detailed credits on all the work that we post. And as our work has become more public, I think that the, the team really uh, appreciates and wants that. But what we found about that, which was interesting to us, was that um, by giving people credit, it seems, to, it seems to up the ante a little bit on the, the dedication to certain aspects of the project. And now that people are sort of like publicly connected to a thing, they don't want to be connected to a, a turd. So like, people like, <laughs> work a little harder. And it's, and it's, uh, so that's one thing that was interesting. And another thing was that it really helped us get organized as a team. And I think um, when, when the lines were blurry and nothing was clearly defined, it was easy for people to have kind of blurry roles. But then, you know, now that we're saying, like, you know, Sean is doing art direction, then in the project, people kind of know what he's doing. And, and it's easier to sort of, as a, as a group internally, to, to parse that stuff out and silo it in a way that is much more organized. So it just forced us to snap into shape. Authorship. Um, T is for throw it out. Um, don't be afraid to throw out everything that you've done and completely start fresh. Um, it's hard to do that, especially when you've logged a lot of hours and, and blood and sweat and tears and the group's invested a lot into it. But don't fear not. There are better ideas out there or other ideas or the good ones that you had before will float back up. They always do. They'll come back to the surface, um, but you sometimes need a, a clean slate to get there. So um, throw it out. Throw it out. Uh, I is for I hate my client. <laughs> <laughs> um, when things get hard on a project or kind of gnarly, like if the, the scope goes really sideways or revisions come in really late or you totally miss on the creative and they hate what you're doing, um, I'm, I'm guilty of of going like, oh, well, the client's an idiot. <laughs> or just like thinking someone's like not smart or like uh, is a, a mean person or that they should just do something else in their life or whatever. <laughs> but um, I think what we're slowly learning is that 90% of client relationship failures are our process failures. And we had, um, we had a project that really brought this to light in the winter and, and it, was, it was like, Terrible, and I've actually got like a screenshot of the harvest report on my desktop, and it's called "Lest We Forget." And like internally, we went over budget by like a hundred thousand dollars or something. Like it was, I think we got paid less than minimum wage for the project, and it's because like it was no one's fault. But internally, so many of us skipped pieces of the process because we thought it would be more efficient, or because we thought that's what the client wanted. And what we realized at the end was like we are the experts in our process, and. For us to do a good job of what we do, we need to do it the way we say we're going to do it in our like production services agreement and the scope documents. And when we don't do that, you start to just kind of like fishtail all over the road. And and we kind of did that, and it was a huge uh, learning. And um, and in the end, I really appreciated uh, stopping hating them and hating myself about it. <laughs> but it was it was good to learn. It was good to learn. Like clients, like clients. Jay's you still to... not over this project. I know. I'm still talking <laughs> it comes about up all it. The time. <laughs> when people hire you to do something, they're hiring you because they don't know how to do that thing. So you need to, you know, um, package that knowledge and go forward and, and be firm and, and loving about that process. But, but it's a collaboration. So anyway, don't always hate your client. Always for ownership. Um, we have learned the hard way that if you um, leave a creative session without everybody knowing exactly what they're meant to do next, um, everybody goes away and does a whole lot of nothing. <laughs> comes back, comes back together, you know, after high fiving uh, at the end of a really good session. So it's important to have those sort of action items, and we call it a go list, so everybody knows what they're doing. Um, actually, when when uh, we were asked to do this talk, I thought that Jay was going to put together the presentation. He thought that I was going to put the <laughs> and, and, and we did it last night. So, but, but, but if you leave it to the last minute, it only, only takes, takes a, a minute. minute. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's true. No Twitter, no Twitter. <laughs> Please, go.
don't don't be tw tw tweet that. I hate my client slide. I, last night I was like, oh god, somebody's gonna take a photo of that slide. Out of context. And that's all it. <laughs> Um, yeah. Okay, but the other there's another part of ownership, which is um, which is making sure that uh, the people on the team know what they're supposed to do, but also what they're meant to to be in charge of. And so that's just the way that we look at collaboration with our team. Um, so that the kind of the knights of the round table thing, although that sounds great in concept. And and Chris, with your ideas group, you know, I, I heard you say, well, we'll all decide together. And I, I applaud you if that works. <laughs> that's awesome. But for us, uh, it works a lot better if we. Um, everybody knows what they own um, and, uh, and can sort of succeed within that little smaller box within the team. So I was for ownership. And this is the last one. And is for nobody gets left behind. Um, and I think this is maybe the most important thing about collaboration in general, if you screw all the other stuff up, is that knowing that we succeed and fail together Always. And so if I fail, my whole team has failed for letting me fail. And if somebody in my team fails, I have failed for letting them fail. And um, part of this is like a, a process thing. So you know, maybe it's checking in every day. Or maybe it's just taking your headphones off and looking around the room. Or I don't know what it is. But, um, but what we found is that uh, in order to really collaborate properly, we need to, we need to feel safe. We need to feel like a family. We need to be able to like, discuss what's going on. And we just need to. Um, care about one another enough that if someone's really struggling, maybe you stay late and you help them out. And maybe no one else knows, but you just do it because that's what a team does. And so, yeah. And one, I mean, a giant ant in particular, like we do a lot of stuff outside of work together, so we'll go for drinks or we'll have lunches and that kind of stuff. And, and just like building a relationship where people have a chance to get to know each other outside of projects and care about one another is really helps that. So I don't want Enrique to fail because I really like him. Sorry, I can just see you, that's all. <laughs> um, yeah. So that was our easy 13 letter, oh no, acronym about collaboration. Or elaboration, it looks like. My first question is for you. Who can tell me their favorite thing they heard today? Favorite statement, favorite phrase, favorite, go ahead. It only takes a minute. <laughs> Giant ad sticker for you. Okay, how about another one? Todd. You can't Todd. Hut tons of Giant ad sticker for you. <laughs> Dung huts and shit. Todd Smith used to work at Giant Ant. Todd Smith. Woo, you probably already have a sticker. Didn't get credit. He, he was there before they gave credit. He never existed. He you never existed. <laughs> okay, who has a question for our speakers? Nobody. Right there. Uh, my name is Anna, and our group wanted to know, in part, I'm, I guess I'm speaking for everyone in some way, um, how do you choose your clients? If you have this parameter of, like, that you go through as a collective or as individuals, how do you choose your clients? Um, am I back on? Yeah, there we go. Um, I guess ultimately it is Jay and I who decides uh, the, uh, which clients we take on. Um, however, we have had experiences where um, we've been unsure about whether the subject matter or the client itself um, fits within our um, our, our team's sort of collective morals and all those all those things. So there's certain areas that we 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 don't work in, um, uh, but we have sort of pulled the group before and mm -hmm. asked the team whether whether or yeah. not they and, and and sometimes we haven't taken a project because one person on the team is not um, okay with it for whatever reason. Yeah. So we respect that and, and and we decline. And it's hard to do that um, often. Yeah, it's hard to do that, especially when the budget's awesome. <laughs> yeah. But to expand on that, we, we have, there, there's um, one like really cursory checklist that we do, which is, would our moms be proud? Is this a creative opportunity? Is it a financial opportunity? Uh, will we show this work? Like, 
And, oh, and uh, then there's also, would we use that project ourselves? Yes, the product would we would that, use that product or service ourselves. So that's one. So like, there's been a lot of pharmaceutical stuff or like shaving cream for young girls and stuff. That we've or like, like diet ah. pills while you sleep. Yeah. <laughs> um, oh, I want some of those. <laughs> Where do you get those? We, d we don't know. We didn't take it. <laughs> Costco, actually. Really? It's, it's true. Oh, of course, of course. <laughs> Thank you for sharing your experience. You said you have twins. How do you collaborate with your children's grandparents? Do you have a very friend? <laughs> with the grandparents? And, yeah. Yes, and my second question is, in your uh, design, is there any influence of, say, Asian culture, or indigenous uh, First Nation culture, or is it purely Eurocentric? Cool, yeah, mm. great questions. Um, I'll answer the first one. <laughs> <laughs> Um, uh, my, my, uh, the twins' um, grandparents have them right now, so that's working out pretty well for me, because <laughs> I'm here with you guys. Um, and I, I don't know if you want how specific you want to get, but they, uh, you know, they help us out a couple times a week, and uh, they change diapers. That's important. Um, are you a grandparent? Is that why you're curious? Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, before the twins arrived, I made sure, that, like, I talked to my mom and I was like, okay, so, like, if I say to you, mom, I need you to come over and clean my bathroom and then I need you to leave, is that going to be okay? <laughs> <laughs> and she was like, yes, I think so. So you just have to kind of talk a lot and make sure that nobody's feelings get hurt because they just want to cuddle all the time with the twins, right? But there's two of them, so that is like there's more to go around. So I guess that makes things easier for yeah. us. Second question. And as for the more <laughs> difficult question, um, I, I I don't know. I don't I don't know that we think about what we're looking at that way. And everything we gather is on the internet, which has no zip code, I guess. So um, it, it sort of depends. I mean, I guess probably most of our stuff is more inspired by English language stuff that we see and listen to. Um, but we do, we do look elsewhere for stuff too. And we've done, um, we did a project about, uh, about, it was sort of based around Buddhism. And so we got a lot of inspiration from sort of Indian stuff. And we did a project that was a personal project, which is in our real little bit with this kind of ninja guy. And we sort of played with some kind of Japanese kind of watercolor brush stuff. So. <laughs> oh, yes. And so our team is not all European. Uh, Collaboration, or, Jay. Collaboration. Yes. Thank you. So on our team, um, uh, we Canadian have movie. two Brazilians, one American, one Mexican, one Bolivian, one Irish, a few Canadians. Calgary. We recently had a New Zealander. Um, yeah, so we, we've got a pretty diverse team. And so I think that just naturally influences our work. Whitey. Thanks, Roland. <laughs> Hi, my name's Perry. Uh, our group was interested in, in, we talked a lot about your personal relationship, which is very interesting, dynamics, married couple getting together around business. We wondered how you compartmentalize things. Like when you go home, what happens? Do you just mm. not talk about work? What do you do? Yeah. Give us an insight into that. No, Thanks. We, we totally talk about work at home because we love our jobs. So it flows like that all the time. Um, every once in a while we have, you know, we'll be sitting at the table and Jay will say, okay, can I just ask one more work question? And then I'll say, okay, yeah. and then we'll get it done and then we'll go on to being just a married couple. But, mm -hmm. but yeah, we talk about, we talk about work, um, cause we love it. And, um, yeah. Would you yeah, agree with little, that? <laughs> I, yeah, I would. And, but now it's a little different with the twins and like talking about work sometimes makes me really anxious and unpleasant sometimes <laughs> or just gets me irritable or whatever. And so... We've tried to kind of create this no no go zone at home where like I get home and then like we're just a family uh, until tomorrow and unless unless we need to talk about it and right now Leah's at home and I'm at work so if there's work stuff we need to deal with often I'll just go and take a walk and give her a call so I don't have to bring it home later. Our t our team has actually a two part question. We're over Where time. are you? There you are. <laughs> um, so the first part is, how do you make sure that it's not uncomfortable for your team when they're collaborating with you, given that you're a husband and wife? Mm. How do they 
how do they bitch and moan about each of you? <laughs> <laughs> Just get them to answer that question, yeah, maybe. Yeah, <laughs> seriously. I, I don't know. That's a, it's, um... Do you guys think that it's weird? Like, does it ever feel weird? <laughs> <laughs> No. Okay, well, I will say Sometimes. a couple of things. Um, one is that uh, our responsibilities are a little bit different, and so not always. We move around a little bit, but mostly I'm kind of looking at the animation stuff that we do, and mostly Leah's looking at the live action stuff that we do, and we have, um, we sort of have de dedicated teams to both of those kinds of work, so that helps. So we've each got kind of our silo we're sort of in charge of. Um, the other thing is that we, we don't, like, we don't say, like, Hey, babe, and <laughs> stuff at the office. Like, we, we just treat each other like people, and I think that we're really um, fair about uh, taking the best idea and, and not agreeing with each other just because we're married. So yeah. I'm, I'm hopefully, that's, hopefully that's evident to I, I would Yeah, and I would also just add to that that more so than bringing our relationship into work, we bring our dynamic that we've like practice at work into our relationship. So we negotiate all the time, right? Like, and we're calm and we figure things out about the babies and what we're doing mm. on the weekend. And I, I actually think it works well the other way um, for us. So I don't know if it's a problem. If it is, it <laughs> doesn't get said to our face. <laughs> okay, we have time for a couple more. We're gonna go right here. Hi, my name is Brian. Um, question for you, how old is Giant Ant now? We registered the business name in October 2007, but it was a really kind of fluffy start, and we moved into an office in January 2009, so as the two of us. About eight, eight years old then. Yeah. Now. Yeah. How has your role as business managers affected your role as creative people over the last eight years? Mm -hmm. And how question. do you see, is Giant Ant a 100-person agency in five years from now? It's been eight, five years is a long time. So where is Giant Ant in five years from, from now? And how much of a role in the business management between now and then do you guys play versus delegate to other people? Thanks. Good question. Um, can you take that? Do you want to talk about that? Go ahead. OK. I'll just, <laughs> I'll just cut in So um, I need to. <laughs> so for the first bunch of years, we just sort of did it ourselves. and. Did it really poorly, and we got better and better because we made a bunch of mistakes and owed the government lots of money by accident and stuff like that. Um, but as it went, uh, we got to I think nine people, and at that point we brought in a managing director, a little general manager. I'm not sure what he was called exactly, but he was there for about two years, and that was actually some of the funnest time for me personally because I got to step back from all that stuff and just do stuff um, and make the stuff that I wanted to be making, which was really fun. Um, and we were able to sort of our growth spiked there a little bit to 15 from, I guess, eight or nine, really quickly because it sort of freed up more creative capacity to take on more work and all that kind of stuff. Um, and then he left about a year ago, and we've just sort of, we kind of plateaued since then, and, and it feels like right now we're back kind of running the business, and I don't, I think we're kind of at our carrying capacity at 14. Um, and we do talk about bringing another person in that role, and it would afford us some growth opportunities. But, and twins. And Leah's not there right now, so right now it's it's we're probably undermanaged, I'd say. I'm gonna go. Who do I wait? Mm, I'm gonna go in the corner because this is an underrepresented corner. While you find someone, Mark, the second part of that question was where we see ourselves in five years. Oh. Um, we're not sure. <laughs> <laughs> We just had twins two months ago. Damn it! Just give us a minute. <laughs> no, kindergarten. We, yeah. we see ourselves at kindergarten. And kindergarten. <laughs> yeah. Hi, my name is Jen. Uh, Hi, Jen. Our group had a lot of questions actually about collaboration between the two of you versus all of you. Uh, if there was a difference there, and if there was an evolution to that collaboration that you can recognize, or did you just figure it out last night? <laughs> Um, an evolution to our collaboration, yes, um, continuous, I would say. And, um, w you know, whenever we get asked to do something like this, it kind of challenges us again to work together on something. This is kind of, you know, I mean, it was, it was, um, it, it, we didn't have a ton of time because, again, of the twins. We talk about twins a lot. But, um, but it's kind of fun for us to have a creative problem, the two of us. But, yeah, it's changed over time. Um, and sorry, the first part of your question was how that is for the, uh, with our team as well? Uh, 
Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, definitely. Because we were, we got really used to just being the two of us and figuring things out while we made dinner, you know, and just kind of talking all the time. And then we had to make it structured all of a sudden because there were other people, even one more person in that mix uh, with the two of us. Because yeah, you develop a shorthand, you don't realize, and we kind of, I, I think we can kind of read each other's minds too a little bit. So it's almost like we can thin each other's sandwiches. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't work. <laughs> um, we, um, yeah, I think, and I think that we went through a time as well where we, we felt like it was unfair for us to, as a team grew, to collaborate in the way we were, which was like a lot of the dinner table and stuff. So we tried to separate that a little bit and leave decision making for the office when it could be more inclusive. But we just know each other so well now. Like, we've been together for 11 years and we've been together 24 hours a day for most of that. So, um, so it's, it's easy to, I don't know. It's a, it's a long, slow evolution, I suppose. I'm going to ask the last question. Um, we're running out of time. <clears throat> Warrior. We were, pardon me. <laughs> we, were, we were talking, Jay and I, earlier about um, challenging collaboration projects. Sometimes they get out of hand or, or big. And we were talking about like really big collaboration things. And, and he mentioned the, the Shane Kozian um, project. To this day? Was big. Is that what you're talking about? Can you, can you tell them a <laughs> sure. little about how you handled yeah. that and how, what that was? Because I don't think a lot of people realize how that thing went down. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, so um, Shane Kozian, who's a, a spoken word poet, artist, no, we know Shane. Okay, cool. Um, so uh, Shane had done um, a bit of voice work for us for a project uh, for free, and I said, you know, I'll, I'm going to get you back. So when you have something you want to work on with us, bring it to me, to us. Um, so he brought um, me this poem called To This Day, and it's, it's beautiful, um, but it's seven minutes long. <laughs> And, uh, and so a seven minute animation is, is a lot of work and a lot of time. So I suggested to Shane that we um, break the, the, the piece up into 20 second um, uh, segments and put it out to our, our animation community. So pe just people, uh, an animators out there in the world, our animators, people in Vancouver, everywhere, um, and see if they wanted to animate each a little small portion and then we'll we'll sort of curate that and we'll put it all together. So this was the project. Um, so we, we cut the poem up and we blasted it out and, um, and we were overwhelmed with how many people wanted to um, participate. It was about bullying, I should say that. So that's, that was sort of the key, was that it's this incredible poem about um, personal stories about bullying that people just could completely attach themselves to. Um, and we didn't, um, uh, we, we didn't put any parameters on it other than it had to be animated. So there was every different style of animation. And we asked, um, we asked the collaborators to send us uh, a storyboard or uh, you know, a couple sentences about what they were going to do, not because we were going to critique or, or tell them uh, what to do, but just to make sure that they were really in it and were, you know, had buy-in and were going to follow through, I guess, with their piece. So yeah, we had, um, we had several hundred people email us and say they wanted to participate. We had 200. Um, completed animations, 20 second segments um, of animation, and then we went through them and we, um, in the end, the, the poem had um, 40... I think we had 88 finished pieces. 88 finished pieces, yeah. 200, I want to do this, yeah. here's my idea, and it was a lot. F about 40 different um, animators in the final seven minutes, seven minute film. Um, and everything else was posted on the website. That's right, yeah. So that was like a very... Uh, new way of doing things for us. It was totally a unique process, but it worked because, I think, because of the subject matter, because it was bullying. We all have a story. We all have um, something to say about bullying. So um, the, the artwork that people created was exceptionally good. Um, and the video was super well received. And in fact, um, Shane was called by Ted uh, right after the video kind of went, went bananas and was asked to, to quickly come to LA and speak at TED. Um, and he, he performed, yeah, did anyone see that? It was cool, and he performed to the video um, and had his violinist and he, and it was, you know, he timed it sort of just perfectly and yeah. it was very cool. So that was, yeah, that was probably our most unique collaboration where we were collaborating with people all over the world that we didn't know. <clears throat> 
and we, we gave them credit. I, I, <laughs> I imagine some people in the room hands who haven't seen that video. Have not, okay. We're posting a link right now to our channels for you. Uh, I insist that you, your homework is to watch it. It is shocking. Goosebump, tears in your eyes. It is shocking. It is so powerful. Um, there's more to the Shane Kozian story. I know him as well, and we'll leave that for another day. Mm -hmm. I've asked him many times to speak here, and uh, he won't do it. He actually says his stage speaking career is over, yeah. which is interesting. We're going to wrap this up. I want to say very deep thanks. Before you go, thank you.